everyone. Welcome to the last webinar in DF DSF's Listen and Learn professional education series. Um, we'd first like to start out by thanking our educational sponsors who made this series possible. So I'd like to thank Greenwich Biosciences, Norellis, Zogenics, Encoded Therapeutics, and Stoke Therapeutics. And I'd also like to extend a thank you to the American Epilepsy Society for their partnership with DSF to provide CME accreditation for this series. We'll be sending emails following the session today with instructions for claiming credit. If you have any issues with that, you can email me. It's veronica at gervaisfoundation.org. Um, lastly, I just want to encourage you, most of the registrants should have received a link to a survey to fill out prior to the series to assess your baseline knowledge of Gervais syndrome. And after today and the coming week, um, look out for a follow up survey. Um, and even if you were unable to complete the initial survey, we'd ask that you complete the follow up survey for us. Um, today, feel free to drop questions in the chat at any time or to ask questions. Um, to Dr. Miller as he's going through the talk, or if you would like to hold him to the end, that's fine as well. Um, and with that, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Ian Miller. He's a pediatric neurologist and chief of the Department of Neurology at Nicholas Children's Hospital in Miami. He received his medical degree from the University of Iowa and completed residencies in pediatrics at the University of Utah and in neurology and pediatric neurology at the University of Washington. His fellowship in clinical neurophysiology was at Miami Children's Hospital. He serves on the medical advisory board for DSF and has been a tireless clinician, researcher, and advocate supporting the Gervais syndrome community. We're so thankful to have Dr. Miller here today talking about updates in the treatment of SCN1A. Um, thank you, Dr. Miller, for being here. Uh, thanks, Veronica, for that introduction. Um, we're going to be talking about the update in the treatments of SCN1A. And, um, the way that I put my slides together is basically to kind of to cover the topics in the way that um, often I cover them in clinic. So um, hopefully my own patients are not in the audience having to hear all this all over again. But I also hope that we have a chance to stop and um, discuss things as questions come up to you, because that's naturally how it kind of happens when I'm seeing patients for the first time myself or, or talking about treatments for the first time with patients. Um, so it is meant to be interactive, and I hope that um, you do speak up and interject, because definitely um, we have time, I think, to do that based on how the um, slides are constructed. So um, these are my disclosures I have. Um, done uh, consulting work for Greenwich, Zogenix, uh, Biomarin, and Norellis. Um, our learning objectives today are, uh, number one, to explain how we know that any particular treatment is effective. Uh, that's a kind of an overview topic. We have a couple other overview topics before we dive into uh, SCN1A specifically, but we'll explain why epilepsy is a challenging symptom to treat. I think we all know at our core, at a very visceral level that it is, but um, I think there are a couple of reasons why it is that Again, I think we all know, but maybe are helpful to explicitly state. Um, we'll explain the biggest difference between gene therapy and other treatments for epilepsy and SCN1A. And then we'll kind of talk about the FDA approved treatments for Gervais syndrome. Um, and I think I might have uh, one or two non FDA approved treatments. And if people have questions about non FDA approved treatments, we can certainly discuss those too. So, really, this is um, free ranging and can encompass anything or um, exclude anything that we, that we, that we wish. So um, I alluded to this a little bit in my learning objectives, but I'm going to talk about background thoughts before individual treatments. The background thoughts are really in three categories. Uh, first, the nature of measurements uh, and the nature of science. Uh, the second is that epilepsy is noisy, and the third is that epilepsy is more than just seizures. So related to those background ideas, and, and I you know, usually don't talk about this with patients in clinic, but I think that subtext is there, and sometimes it does get brought up later on. But um, Measurement is necessary for science, right? We all know that. And I think um, it, it's sufficiently true that without measurement, there is no science. And one place where this gets a little bit lost in the lay press is you read about, oh, the coronavirus vaccination got approved and it uh, you know, expresses a protein and the protein creates cellular immunity and the cellular immunity makes this antibody and the antibody is going to beat the infection. Well, that's all fine. And that um, certainly is true and it makes sense and it's all valid scientifically, but the real science is not in how the medicine works. It is in what is the impact on the disease. And uh, if I'm going to get COVID, how much more mild are my symptoms? How much less oxygen am I, I going to need? 
Um, and if I'm at risk of getting COVID, what is my percent chance reduced by if I get the, get the vaccination? So um, measurement really is fundamental to anything that we wanna do. And if we focus on the measurement, that's where the money is. And so that's what we'll try to do as we talk about these treatments. Um, so we talked about the corollary. If measurement is not there, then really there's no science to be had and we need to look for the measurement to understand where the science is. Um, and I think this is such a profound idea that you can even prove things that are hard to believe or that even seem untrue. Uh, one example of this is the theory of relativity. You know, everybody uh, who goes to the Wikipedia page and reads about Einstein's theory of relativity will have a big long explanation about um, time slows down and you know, it's all kinds of complicated things about how uh, gravity and speed distort the perception of time. But that's the mechanism and where are the measurements? Well, the measurements are what Einstein predicted based on this theory. And he said, based on this theory, we should see gravitational lensing and it should look like this. And we should see you know, um, changes in uh, you know, the apparent uh, luminosity or um, you know, visible spectra of stars. And it should look like this. So he made predictions and those measurements that validate the predictions are where uh, the science is made. So in a clinical trial, I don't know if I have, yeah, in a, in a clinical trial, usually what we wanna start with is a population of interest. So in this case, you know, we're interested in Dravet syndrome and seizures in Dravet syndrome and learning in Dravet syndrome. We're gonna start with um, that population and then we're gonna define um, an intervention. So in kids that have Dravet syndrome who are treated with benfluramine, and then we're gonna to try to choose an outcome that is gonna be modified by that treatment or that we think is gonna be modified by it. Um, and in this case, we're gonna look at uh, convulsive seizures, for example, and the convulsive seizure frequency. So in patients that have Dravet syndrome that are treated with fenfluramine at a dose of X, Y, or Z, right? Because even that needs to be specified. What is the impact on seizure frequency? And if we're talking about that, that's a hardcore measurement and that is really um, the highest level of science and data that we can get. Um, just to kind of, um, make this point. I hope that this is visible to people, but this is a, a journal article about the effects of exercise for five years on all cause mortality in older adults. And so if you think about it, that has all three components that we just said are super important. In older adults, what is the effect of exercise training for five years in all cause mortality, right? That's hardcore science. Those are really strict measurements. And this is small enough on my screen that I even have a hard time seeing it. But the interesting point is that it did not make any difference in all cause mortality, right? So we all know that exercise is healthy for us and we believe that. Um, but what's interesting is that when measured this way in this population with this specific degree of exercise change, there was not a difference that was uh, you know, measurable or demonstrable to, uh, that was distinguishable from background variability within the populations. Interesting. So. Um, Science is complicated, and um, if we do it right the first time, we're at low likelihood of being reversed by uh, later discoveries. Any thoughts that people have about that, or questions that come up, especially as it relates to Gervais syndrome, because I'd be happy to answer them if they do. These are kind of um, complicated topics, and hopefully it's not too uh, oblique to what we're talking about. If not, we can go on and talk about all of the other things that are part of Gervais syndrome and SCN1A that don't have anything to do with epilepsy. Epilepsy is definitely the most visible part of our disease at times, right? It might not be if we're not having a seizure, but when we're having a seizure, oh my gosh, yeah, um, super visible. Um, and this list, I'm sure, is not even close to being comprehensive, but the other big hardcore morbidities include things that are cognitive, behavioral, mood-related, sleep-related, motor-related, and posture related, right? All of those for sure are affected by SCN1A and by Gervais syndrome and um, are, you know, as important as the epilepsy, sometimes even more important, right? I think um, all parents that I talk to would be willing to trade um, good seizure control in order to get better cognition or normal cognition, right? If we had a choice between a normal cognition child with lots of seizures versus no seizures, but mentally impaired, you know, the, that child is going to have a better chance at independence, even if they're having seizures, if their cognition is normal. So um, I think that's where most parents come down on things. And I think that might be a little bit counterintuitive to people who are just hearing about this for the first time or, um, or are new to it and haven't thought about it. But I think that's true. And then the last point that I wanted to make by way of overview is observing the fact that epilepsy is a super noisy symptom. 
And um, this is obvious in some ways, but I think the impacts can be a little bit subtle. Um, and when I say subtle, what I mean is that um, it impacts uh, how frequently you can change your medicines, right? If you get your seizure control down to one seizure a month, like if you were having 10 a day, that's an awesome improvement, right? But if you get it down to one a month and you have this big awesome improvement and you're happy with that, that's, that's great as far as it goes. But now we're in the position where we can't really tweak the medicines that quickly because if we have one seizure a month, we can't really change the meds every month because we're only expecting to have one. We kind of need to expect two or three seizures probably in that uh, time frame in order to really think that we're making a difference. So the better your seizure control is, the harder it is to adjust the medicines and know for sure that you're doing the right thing and that what you think is going on in terms of, oh, that helped or, oh, that hurt actually is. As a result, um, that phenomenon and, and the noisiness of epilepsy leads to frustration, it leads to uncertainty, it leads to anxiety, and it, it almost leads to kind of like this superstition phenomenon where, um, and I think we've all been there, and I don't, I hope this doesn't sound judgmental or condescending or anything else goes, oh my gosh, um, I'm not talking about only patients, I'm talking about doctors also. We see connections that aren't there as well. But, you know, the human brain is so good at drawing connections between events that when two kind of unlikely things happen together, we think, ah, that has to be something meaningful. That can't be just a coincidence that um, my child uh, had Doritos and then they had a seizure, right? They never get Doritos because that's like a super extreme treat for them. They have a seizure only once a month. And when I give Doritos and they have a seizure right after, twice, that isn't just one sense. Even, even once, right? If it's a rare enough thing, it might think, make you think, okay, this is cause and effect. But um, very, very often we later learn with experience and time and seeing that same association and having an opportunity to observe it again. We give them Doritos and do they have a seizure? No, they didn't have a seizure that time. Well, that's kind of weird. Um, and then we give them Doritos again and they don't have a seizure. So at this point we have like a couple of experiences and a couple of data points where it did or it seemed to. We have a couple of data points where it seemed not to. What do you do and how do you reconcile all of that? It's crazy, right? It's just impossible to remain sane. And um, uh, that quality to me is reminiscent of kind of a superstition where you draw a spurious association. You say, oh, a black cat crossed my path and then my day was rotten. So uh, that must mean that a black cat crossing my path is a bad omen and it has bad connotations for me in terms of my luck or whatever. Um, that's kind of what it um, comes out as and manifests as with epilepsy, I think. So it's not surprising that we get frustrated, uncertain, and feel anxious about these things. And let's be honest, I mean, 2020 is a pretty <laughs> frustrating <laughs> and uncertain and anxious time. So uh, it's not easy at any circumstance. And I think in 2020, it just made our job a whole lot harder. So I'm gonna shift gears here um, and talk about treatments. If anybody has any comments about that, um, I'd love to hear them. I think these are a little bit esoteric and you know, hopefully not dumb. I think these are things that we all um, know and have kind of internalized, right? And I think, I, I hope that it's a little bit helpful to talk through them out loud um, together um, because just, you know, saying things explicitly sometimes helps bring it into focus and helps wrap your mind around something that might be bothering you, but it's hard to really put your finger on. Um, and as a result, I'd really love any input that anybody else might have in terms of ways that they think about these issues, um, because I think they're just so fundamental to what we do that the better we understand um, how they fit and how they affect us, the better off we are. Um, There's I'm not seeing any in the chat, Ian, but I, I had a comment that I'd love to hear more. Um, so the example that you threw up earlier with the paper um, and sort of, you know, asking the right questions and measuring and looking at the outcomes. Um, I guess one thing that came to mind for me was that you can still, I don't know if I want to say choose the wrong outcome, but maybe you're still having an effect. Maybe you're still having an effect in that example on mortality, but maybe you need to look at you know, mortality related to cardiac issues or things like that. And so I think that's something in theme with how you're bringing up. It's more than just seizures. It's so many of these other outcomes that become increasingly more difficult to measure. Um, but I think that's something we want to move more towards, right? Um, especially as we find meds that control seizures better. But like you were saying, 
you're still having one seizure a month, you'd still like to see that gone, but how do we, how do we measure that more precisely? So I guess yeah. it's more of a comment than a question, but. No, no, I think that's absolutely spot on and that's a great point. I think these things are so fundamental that there are a million different directions that you can go in. Um, and I'd love to explore that just for a little bit if that's, you know, okay with the folks who have taken time out of their day to log on. Um, the way that I see that relate in a major way to where the Gervais community and the Gervais Syndrome Foundation and all of the allies that we have and, um, you know, trying to help us move the ball forward relates to which outcomes are the right ones for us to choose for our kids, right? Like, um, and I, I, I hear some frustration, honestly, not as much as people, I think, probably feel and not as much probably as they deserve to feel about the fact that all of our outcomes are always seizures, right? Okay, well, the, uh, fenfluramine improves seizures, Epidiolex improves seizures, uh, you know, uh, nasal diazepam stops seizures and seizure, seizure, seizure. Why don't I, why don't I have outcomes about anything else? Especially when you just told me, Dr. Miller, that seizures are not the most important thing cognition is, right? That's a totally valid point. And um, the reason is simply due to practicality. You know, as noisy as epilepsy is, cognition is noisy also. And that's not noisy because your cognition fluctuates. It's noisy because your effort fluctuates, right? And cognition and our measurements of cognition are so dependent on effort. So if you get a hungry kid, if you get a crabby kid, if you get a, you know, unmotivated kid, their performance on those metrics is just going to nosedive. And so your measurement of their performance is noisy. It's, you know, taking the same test on a different day might give you different results, right? Um, and as a result of that, it's way less guaranteed that a treatment, even if you're really, really, really think and suspect that it will improve cognition in a fundamental and important way, it's just that much harder to put all of your eggs in that basket from a funding standpoint. And yeah, we're going to fund the study with this outcome as the primary outcome, because we didn't really talk about that, but every study needs to have a primary outcome that it lives or dies by, right? And those trials almost always use and have historically always used epilepsy as their primary outcome because that's the one that's most likely to be doable, right? Um, the other thing about cognition, which is just so hard to understand and, and appreciate the scope of the truth of the statement is the fact that the brain is hard to measure, you know? And I think what makes this the clearest is that we need to measure these kids, some of whom are, you know, kind of infantile in their abilities. Uh, they're not able to um, communicate with words. They're able to kind of communicate with expressions or uh, sounds their parents are familiar with or um, their behavior, right? But they can't communicate verbally or, vo or verbalize things. Um, they might not be able to follow commands. And, and so doing anything that involves verbal instructions or responding verbally is completely impossible, right? Um, so think about how those scores are going to look, even if they have cognitive abilities that might be preserved somewhere else versus kids who are minimally affected and essentially are, you know, at grade level or close to it, the gulf between those is just ginormous. So it's kind of like trying to measure the distance between uh, the sun and Pluto on the same yardstick that you're using to measure between atoms. You know, like you can't have one yardstick that's going to do both. Um, and that's how hard the brain is because of how uh, multidimensional and uh, profoundly different in, you know, uh, power that it can be. So... Yeah, those are some some great points you alluded to, and I hope uh, I haven't butchered your point in terms of thinking about them uh, a little bit farther out. Okay, any other comments? Oh, oh great, we have uh, a comment here in the chat box. Uh, the comment is, my experience as a grandfather of a Dreve child is that we look to find the best polytherapy for seizure reduction and address the other comorbidities through PTOT and speech therapy. And of course, every child is an out of one. Yeah, and I, uh, I think that's absolutely true. I think neurologists are definitely guilty of fixating on the epilepsy piece, not because we think that's the most important, but because that's the one thing we have a lever that really is connected to it. You know what I mean? Um, that same lever is less directly connected to cognition and, and behavior and mood, but for sure it is, right? I mean, we, uh, if we get unlucky and we choose the, you know, the, the, levetiracetam lever or whatever and really crank on it, we might see some major irritability or, or mood or behavior side effects, in which case we think, oh my gosh, we really went too far on that one to try to pull it back. Um, but we focus on epilepsy because that's the one thing that we have the best chance of helping. And 
um, you know, e even I think the, the therapies that can be uh, extremely useful and that we try to maximize as much as possible aren't nearly as profound as the medicines can be on their target symptom, I guess. Yeah, so thanks for that comment um, from the audience. Okay, so um, with that, we'll kind of uh, shift gears into treatments and um, I'd love it if people have comments or experiences that they wanna share with us um, as we talk about these. But um, I did wanna mention that there is no formal algorithm. Um, there is something that looks like a formal algorithm that Dr. Whirl, who is just a tireless um, scholar and uh, you know advocate um, for kids that have Dravet syndrome, put together with the help of her collaborators. But it was the North American Consensus Panel on the Treatment of Dravet Syndrome. And they did a really nice job summarizing actual practice uh, in this paper that they published in 2017. And if you can read that again, I hope that you can. I have it kind of in a, a windowed view on my monitor, so it's smaller. But basically, valproic acid or clobazam is at the top, and it was the first choice for the people that they surveyed. And then the second line was the addition of steropentol or topiramate or the ketogenic diet. And importantly, this all predates Epidiolex and uh, Fintepla and um, uh, steropentol. So um, none of those were approved in this, although steropentol. Uh, was available to many through a you know exemption process. That's why it made the um, the outline. I think this slide really is where we need to go back to what we said earlier about the science, right? This is not science at all. This is simply a survey of doctors and what they do in the absence of science. Okay, this is kind of like ignorance um, trying to. Um, make itself a little bit less ignorant, but not by doing science, by just kind of comparing notes and, you know, uh, comparing anecdotes. So this is an awesome first step. I do not mean to disparage Dr. Worrell's work at all, because this is a phenomenal first step, but we just have to be honest with ourselves that it's not a scientific process. It's a statement of what people are doing in the status quo when science does not exist that compares how good these relative treatments are. Okay, so, um, you know, with that overview, Let's talk a little bit about the treatments that are on the horizon and are out and that are novel. Um, the first one I think that just has to be discussed first is genetic therapy. And um, we can talk about any of these elements. I think this, these are just like one slide at a time. Let me look really quick on my preview to see. Yeah, so um, this is all the content that I have on my slides. We can just kind of talk through this. But basically, um, the measurement with gene therapy, this out of all the medicines, out of all the treatments, I think this has the most promise, I guess, of helping those other multimodal parts and those other non-epilepsy parts of the epilepsy or the other non-seizure parts of the epilepsy because it is able to fix the gene. Um, another way that I like to talk to my patients about the cognition piece, because cognition is so important, um, even though I can't treat it any more effectively than any other doctor can, I do like to point out to them that there's really three contributors to the cognition. Um, the first major contributor is the seizures. And when the seizures are just so relentless, especially early on, and you have a major hit in cognition about the same time, it's a normal assumption to think, okay, the, the seizures are the reason the cognition is impacted, right? I mean, that just is intuitive and common sense. But it ends up not being the complete answer. Um, I think we all can kind of appreciate that if we're on too much medicine, that that's going to affect our cognition, right? So that's like the second part of this tripod of uh, pain, I guess, um, that we have to think about. And the way that I think about it is that we do have a little bit of a, you know, kind of a lever that we, we can, um, you know, I guess I used the lever analogy earlier, but here it actually is <laughs> physically. Um, we have kind of a lever that we can kind of pull back towards more seizures or uh, less medication side effects or go the other way. Um, which is uh, more medication side effects, but less seizures, right? And it's kind of a balance between those two. So it's kind of like that old fashioned operation game where if you get too close to either side, you get buzzed because you went too far and you touched it. Um, but if we thread the needle and really balance those correctly, hopefully we'll be able to kind of get the best quality of life. And hopefully that best quality of life is none of either, but sometimes we're dealing with a little bit of either. What's the third finger that I'm showing here? I, you, you knew that one was coming and that is the effect of the gene itself. This is the most subtle one by far, so I don't mean to belabor anything or state something that's already obvious, but this is a sodium channel, right? And what a sodium channel does is exactly what it sounds like. It is a hole through which a salt ion can flow. And what makes this sodium channel unique is that it is responsive to voltage. Uh, voltage is when uh, there's an electrical tickle from the surrounding environment, usually from a, uh, you know, another nerve 
fiber ending basically coming down on it, landing on it and tickling it with electricity. And if enough of those tickles hit at the same time, they kind of sum up. And if it reaches a critical mass of tickling, that uh, sodium channel will open and then close again and deactivate itself. So it is a voltage sensitive hole through which salt can flow. And that's running our brain, right? Not by itself, by any stretch of the imagination, but um, it is a critical part of it, right? It's like a symphony, right? If you don't have the, um, you know, the violins, then it's going to sound off. Those are a critical part of the, the fullness of the sound. And so not only do you have the effect of the seizures and the effect of the medicines, but you have the direct effect of a fundamental part of this orchestra or symphony not functioning it the way that it should function, right? That's clearly going to be able, whether it does or not, I guess we need to do some measurements and do some real science to figure it out. But that clearly has the potential to directly muck with learning. And that's the one piece that we can't touch with our conventional seizure medicines. Our conventional seizure medicines are here, and gene therapy is the very first treatment which can address this. That's why gene therapy is exciting. And I think we all know that, um, but that's just a different way to think about it. So effectiveness to be determined, right? Out of all the medicines, this is the one that we want to be able to choose for our primary outcome, cognition, behavior, mood, learning, uh, coordination, these things. That would be so awesome. It's so exciting to do. But as the you know, one medical person giving input to the um, people designing the study and the one sponsoring the study, the, the <laughs> pathetic answer when they ask, what does the primary outcome need to be? It's epilepsy, it's seizures, because that is the thing that is going to get it approved. And we have to get it approved. And, you know, slowly over time, we hope that we'll be able to prove and show that there's um, improvement in these other areas. But if it's effective for the, for the layup, at that point, we can move on, right? Um, adverse effects. Um, we don't know. So just like we don't know the effectiveness, we don't know the adverse effects yet because it's not studied. Um, it is important to know, and I think a lot of the audience probably does know, that there are analogous medicines on the market today for other diseases. Um, you know, as awful as Dravet syndrome is, I uh, think that uh, there are other diseases that are worse, and one of them has to be spinal muscular atrophy. Um, spinal muscular atrophy is when your nerves that power your muscles uh, just spontaneously die in infancy. And these babies who are born with it are very floppy at birth and they only get weaker. They get so weak that they can't even move their chest wall to breathe. It's just awful. Um, and it's fatal uniformly uh, in the first year of life. No infant can survive it. And so this was the very first um, place, disease, in which this strategy of kind of an oligonucleotide being introduced uh, with an intrathecal injection was done and it was effective, right? So we know that the, in, in theory, in concept, that study worked, that science worked, their outcome was survival. That's like a hardcore endpoint, right? You're making these kids live when they otherwise would not have. Um, using a oligonucleotide, that what that means is a short fragment that's kind of like um, the cap or the lid of the DNA that exactly fits their gene well, why can't we rearrange that sequence into the SCN1A gene instead of the SMN gene uh, and have it help our kids? Well, it turns out we might be able to, and this is our chance to prove it. Um, and because that approach is so analogous, it's likely that the types of side effects that they saw in their study will be similar to the side effects that we see. Do they have to be exactly the same? Heck no, we're doing a different gene. We might have gene-specific side effects. But the gene agnostic side effects of putting an oligonucleotide of any kind into the spinal fluid should be relatively consistent. And those are things like platelet counts dropping, uh, you know, to some degree. Um, they had some incidents of, um, you know, uh, inflammation of the meninges where they injected the, the medication, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, I think it's, there's a reason to be cautiously optimistic about not only the potential, but also the adverse effect of profile. So I think by talking about those pieces, we've already kind of understood where its role in treatment might be with the caveat that we don't know yet because it's too new. Um, so those are my thoughts about gene therapy. If anybody else has any other questions, um, I'm happy to address those now. If you want to put them in the chat box or uh, raise a hand and say it out loud, um, there's a hand raise option somewhere, I think, on the window. Um, but I also do want to um, have a chance to touch on the other uh, medications, especially those that are FDA approved for Dravet syndrome specifically. So I'm um, not seeing any. I'll move on and, and talk about those. 
Um, we have fenfluramine next on the list um, because it's kind of the next most new, I think, if I have my timing straight. Uh, this is also called fintepla. And um, the measurement for fenfluramine was in seizure control. They looked at the uh, frequency of um, convulsive seizures, I think. There, there's a lot of studies that I have in my brain right now, but I think that was what their uh, outcome was. And the um, rates of improvement are what are worth talking about. Um, and the, and fenfluramine, you know, frankly has eye popping effectiveness relative to all other medicines uh, that have come out recently and, and kind of conventional seizure medicines. Um, we do have one question. Uh, this looks short enough that we can kind of back up a little bit and talk about gene therapy. The question is if gene therapy does not succeed, do you see the day where one can enter uh, into an AI type of database, like type SCN1A, mutation, age, sex, et cetera, and get a suggestion for the best course of treatment. Um, I think that question relates to the best course of conventional anticonvulsant treatment. And um, I certainly hope so. I think the problem is that AI is not necessarily magic. You know, AI can't create data where there is no data. So it can kind of draw conclusions based on um, trends or patterns or things like that that might not be obvious to us, but that do exist. And I think the problem here is that there are just so many variables and the parameter space is so monstrous that that I think is a really tall order even for the most advanced AI that I can personally imagine. Um, I also think that better than that, better than AI would be a simple head-to-head -head trial where kids are randomly assigned to uh, fenfluramine or uh, cannabidiol or um, you know, steropentol or valproic acid or levetiracetam and you know you get randomly assigned to it and we look in the same study what the results are if we could do that that would um, tell us and we could maybe start to tease apart what factors make one kid respond to one and another kid not and vice versa um, but that's a long way off and um, you know this deserves to be its own bullet point and a list of frustrations in terms of like not even being able your doctor not even being able to tell you a priori which medicines can be the best one. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Like how embarrassing for child neurologists, but it is the case. And, um, you know, I don't know who your child neurologist is, but I know they're um, uh, practicing the state of the art process because it's embarrassing for all of us as lame as that is. Okay, so um, shifting gears back to fenfluramine. Uh, we're looking at the primary outcome being the frequency of convulsive seizures, and I already stated that I think it's kind of eye-popping in its effectiveness relative to conventional medicines. Once you're three, four, five medicines deep, uh, meaning that you've tried one, it didn't work, tried a second, you're still having seizures, tried a third, you're still having seizures, and it may have helped, right, but still having seizures is the key part, right? It's not 100% gone, you're not uh, free of seizures. Um, the chance of the fourth and the fifth and the sixth medicine really hitting a home run is just, you know, really low, like less than a percent. And fenfluramine stepped into that same, uh, you know, trench basically, and, you know, just uh, did a phenomenal job. And the average reduction in seizure frequency was 70% in the fenfluramine trial, which is staggering. Um, not only were, was there a 70% average reduction in seizures, meaning that some kids don't have a 70% reduction and some kids do better, right? That's the really incredible part. And enough kids did better that of the kids that entered into the treatment trial, 10% were actually seizure free for the duration of the treatment trial, which is I think 12 weeks or 16 weeks for that particular study. That is incredible. Um, so, you know, the most exciting therapy in terms of the effect size to me is on the horizon and it's gene therapy. The second most exciting therapy in terms of the impact that it can have on your child is fenfluramine. Um, the adverse effect profile is um, quite good with a little bit of an asterisk. Quite good means that it's not sedating, uh, which is awesome, or it doesn't, hasn't been in my experience. I think every uh, seizure medicine has some incidence of somnolence or sedation or whatever in, you know, in the single digits or double digits, uh, low double digits, but um, not overtly so. Um, and um, the asterisk is the fact that there is a known um, history of fenfluramine. Fenfluramine was used in the 1990s for weight loss, and it was used in a combination treatment where there was fenfluramine, which is what we're talking about today, and fentermine, which has no known role in the treatment of epilepsy. It was used in weight loss. Those two medications, when taken together, did cause thickening of the heart valve, and that's a permanent side effect that can be life-threatening if it's not noticed early, and it might even need surgery if you do notice it early, but not early enough. 
like that's a huge issue, right? So um, thickening of the heart valve um, is the boogeyman in the fenfluramine trial. Um, we know that this happened in adults who took both medicines. In kids that took only fenfluramine for epilepsy, there was a Belgian cohort that was kind of open label done by a single practitioner, not in the setting of a clinical trial, but just um, in clinical practice. And he treated his patients for over a decade and did not have any of about 20 patients develop this side effect. Um, that's his report, and we're just taking his experience at face value, which I think is reasonable to do. Um, in a more rigorous way, the kids in this trial were monitored basically every three months for heart valve changes, and none were seen. So at this point, about 300 or so kids have been in the trials, and thousands of echocardiograms have been done, and there's been no thickening of the heart valve at all. Does that mean you cannot have heart valve thickening? No. You could do a billion heart echoes and not have any thickening and the billionth and one might have heart valve thickening for the first time. So obviously the fact that we haven't seen it yet does not mean it cannot happen, but every single patient and every single echocardiogram that gets done is just one more data point that makes us feel a little bit more relaxed. And kind of like when you have a good seizure streak going uh, and you're hoping you're finally to the point where you're going to be seizure free over the long term, you know, one more day doesn't get you there, but it makes you feel a teeny tiny bit better. This is kind of the same, the same place. So um, that's fenfluramine. Uh, that's why we're excited about it. I, you know, I think with seizure control, you can definitely see the impact that these three things have um, on cognition. I, I think the effect of the gene on cognition is just giant. Um, but I do have kids that still have the gene and all of the problems that it causes directly, but are now having awesome seizure control, right? So kind of buried the needle with zero seizures and really minimal side effects. Um, and there's a mom who comes to my office and you know basically cries every visit because her daughter is remembering things and, um, you know, mentioning um, things that her mom never thought she could possibly retain because her seizure control was so poor at that point in her life. Um, and she's just moved to tears by the, um, you know, profound improvement that her daughter has had due to fenfluramine. Um, so we have a question related to fenfluramine, and if any of you guys uh, have other questions, please post them now because we're going to be shifting gears in a second. But the question is based on Zogenix's rollout of only 300 patients on commercial drug at the end of September. It appears the REMS re uh, requirement, I think, uh, for baseline echo is slowing uptake or access, and what are my thoughts? Um, I do think that the REMS requirement for a baseline echo is slowing uptake. I have uh, a handful of patients that really want to start it, but just can't bring themselves to go to the echo lab and get the echo done in this setting of, you know, crazy COVID-19. Um, do I think that was the wrong call by the FDA? Um, you know, I don't know. I don't necessarily think so. I, I you know, um, I think it's absolutely critical that we make um, decisions based on the best, best interest of the child and what's safe. And I think that an echo is safer than, rolling the dice in a drug that's only been tried in 300 patients so far and might have this really catastrophic side effect. Um, I think the timing is poor. I don't know that it's the best thing given COVID-19, you know, um, but uh, I certainly don't fault them for having made that call back then. Do I think it should be waived or suspended in some way? Um, man, I really don't know. I, uh, um, I, I, there's like so much else. I think it should kind of be left up to the patient and the doctor. Um, I would trust my colleagues to make this decision because I know that they care a lot about the kids that they take care of um, more than I trust the FDA. And in an ideal world, the FDA wouldn't have to step in because the doctors would all be doing the right thing. But there are doctors out there that just don't know that it's an issue. And so they're not being careful enough and might not, uh, you know, get the echo when they need it. But good question. I hope that answers it. Okay. So without seeing any other questions, I'll move on um, to cannabidiol. Um, there's lots of formulations of cannabidiol, but the one that we use exclusively in uh, in our facility is Epidiolex because it is a pharmaceutical formulation and doesn't have the batch-to-batch -batch inconsistencies and unknowns, I guess, of the other non-cannabidiol cannabinoids. Um, so um, I don't want to get a, caught up a whole lot in the um, pharmacology about that unless um, there are people in the audience who really want to discuss it, but I do want to focus on the measurement and the effectiveness and the adverse effects. The measurement in cannabidiol has been done now um, four times, um, actually five, I think. There's uh, two studies in LGS, two studies in Gervais, and one study in tuber sclerosis. All of them have been remarkably consistent, so they're not identical, um, and I'm going to take a, like, you know, a five percentage point liberty, I think, in talking about these numbers, um, but I'm going to kind of aggregate them and talk about them in broad strokes because they're not that different. Um, they did vary, though, in terms of what kinds of seizures were measured. In um, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, they measured 
drop seizures. In Dravet syndrome, they measured convulsive seizures. And in tuberous sclerosis, they measured TS-related seizures, which would basically be any kind of seizure that happens in tuberous sclerosis, a large portion of which are complex partial seizures. So um, you get some sense from the um, five studies that have been done that there's not a huge impact related to what kind of seizure is it, which is kind of nice. We don't have to get caught up in that. And I guess, to, you know, to the other um, audience members question, it, you know, that's a factor that we can't use to inform our AI system. Um, but I guess I'm happy not to have to think about it if it helps everybody, right? Um, so those are what was measured in each individual cohort and the effectiveness within that outcome for each um, cohort was basically highly, highly consistent approximately 40% improvement in seizure frequency. Okay, and if you recall back to the fenfluramine example, that was a 70% improvement in seizure frequency. This is a 40% improvement in seizure frequency. It's not fair to either medication to, to compare those back to back like that because it's not the same study. Um, there's differences in time. There's all kinds of differences in the inclusion exclusion criteria that were used. So um, it is not a valid head-to-head -head comparison, but at the same time, it's the best we have. So uh, I'll just apologize <laughs> and do it anyway with all the caveats that um, you know that come with it, um, and more to kind of help reinforce and, and just frame your thoughts around this idea and emphasize the fact that the numbers matter um, more than anything else. Um, so the average reduction in seizure frequency in the cannabidiol studies was approximately 40%, no matter which of the five studies we're talking about. Um, and importantly, the seizure freedom rate was substantially less than fenfluramine. It was um, on the order of um, two or 5%, depending on which one of the studies we're talking about, but single digits for sure and low single digits. Um, the other way that this study looked at seizure improvement was looking at the 75% improvement or better. So if you say, look, uh, seizure freedom is too much to hope for, 40% is too lame to talk about, tell me the number of patients that really responded well, you know, that had a life changing or, or a substantive improvement enough that they're going to tell their friends and family about it and, and be happy about it and kind of like feel warmly inside about the medicine. How many of those were there? And that depends on where you put that threshold, right? But if you say that that threshold is a 75% improvement in seizures, well, then I can answer that question because the data has been published and is available. And about a quarter of the patients had a 75% improvement in their seizures. Um, so Hopefully that um, gives us a sense of scale and improvement and whatever related to cannabidiol. Um, the adverse effects of cannabidiol are um, definitely well known and I'm super grateful that the clinical trial was done, not only because now we know that it works for epilepsy, but also we have some sense of what the adverse effects are. The biggest adverse effect is uh, an increase in the ALT and AST. It's definitely manageable, but the labs definitely need to be measured and it's a pain in the neck that we have to and is unfortunate. Um, I haven't had any patients really get into trouble, but I do have colleagues that, um, you know, had a little bit of a, a scare and, you know, thankfully the patients did okay when the medicines were uh, lowered afterwards. It can be sedating, but most often the sedation is caused by an interaction with um, clobazam. Uh, clobazam really is bumped up a lot with epidiolex and therefore uh, if you see sedation, that's the first thing you want to do is lower it. Um, and it does have a little bit of sedating ability itself. It also causes some GI changes, sometimes diarrhea, sometimes appetite changes. Um, and I think related to the clobazam interaction, there is an increased risk of infection, which I think is probably related to pneumonia um, and aspiration pneumonia because it blunts your um, oropharyngeal coordination and it makes you drool more and it makes you uh, have a harder time clearing your oral secretions and therefore you get aspiration and you might get a pneumonia from that. So um, its role in treatment, I think, is right there at the top. You know, if we redid that consensus statement with opinions, I think the opinions now would be that um, conformin and epidiolex are the, the top two contenders. You know, I don't know which one should be done first, and I'll just be agnostic about that completely because I don't even think I'm consistent in my own practice. Um, it really depends on whether you're valuing the immediate start uh, because cannabidiol, I think, it can be a little bit faster. It depends on whether or not you're more turned off by low-grade side effects that are likely, in which case it's cannabidiol, versus um, big bang impacts that are a little bit less likely, in which case it's fenfluramine. Um, so those two definitely near the top and are both uh, solid, solid options for treatment. Um, I have a question here, which is great. It says, uh, any thoughts about the role of THC? I think Tilray did a small study with CBD plus THC as rescue. Um, in our case, CBD plus fenfluramine was not a good combo compared to CBD plus valproate. Yeah, and so um, 
these uh, anecdotes are certainly important and are certainly informative and certainly uh, help you make decisions for your child and help your doctor learn in aggregate from their patients. Um, the problem though, and I didn't really belabor this too much about the measurement, but the measurement really needs to be a double blind, placebo controlled, randomized clinical trial. Um, and so that is the gold standard uh, by which all of the biases, bias is the way you're measuring something affecting the measurement itself, right? The placebo effect is one place where the bias comes in. If you know that the kid's getting the active ingredient or the active medicine, you think it's gonna help and therefore it does help and it skews your measurement. So a double blind placebo controlled randomized clinical trial is removes essentially all of the bias that we are able to remove. Um, and it's um, what's left is the actual scientific truth and the measurable improvement that is brought about by the treatment itself. Um, so THC has not been measured in this way. That's, I guess, the bottom line. Um, let's talk about steropentol. Um, this has been around a whole lot longer than any of the first two that we talked about. Um, it's, um, you know, uh, interesting because it requires um, clobazam and valproic acid in combination for its FDA labeling. Um, although I think uh, the clobazam probably is the more important of the two, is my guess. Um, the measurement for it is seizures in Gervais syndrome. If the effect size is kind of comparable to the fenfluramine, it had a very dramatic improvement also. Um, but in my practice, it is way more challenging to use due to its adverse effects and its interactions with other medicines. Um, it is uh, you know, um, recommended or the, the labeling says you can go up to 50 milligrams per kilogram per day. But in my experience, especially in older kids, uh, the ceiling on that is much, much lower due to the adverse effects that it can have. And as a result, its role in treatment for me personally is below the other two that we talked about earlier. Um, I definitely use it. I'm glad that it is FDA approved now and is available in every state and can get insurance coverage for it because prior to FDA approval, it wasn't available to my patients in Florida, basically, uh, although other states were progressive and did um, have kind of blanket Medicaid coverage for it. Um, you know, I, I still use it after fenfluramine and um, cannabidiol, personally. I'm ready to go kind of quickly. I think this might be, you know, there's, well, a handful more, yeah. So I think we've covered the meat of what we really want to talk about, which were the novel and exciting ones. But I do want to talk about brom bromide briefly, because I do get questions about this from other uh, families and other providers. Um, bromide was the oldest seizure medicine. It was discovered, you know, 150 years ago to help with seizures and um, under a completely mistaken basis. But um, it has not had a randomized double blind placebo control trial, but it is so profoundly effective that you don't need one to see that it works. It's kind of like phenobarbital or alcohol. You don't need a randomized double blind placebo control trial of alcohol to see if it makes you drunk because it's obvious, right? The effect is just so uh, smack you in your face. There's no way that you can confuse a drunk person from a sober person. Um, that is how effective bromide can be. Um, so, however, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, the measurement and the effectiveness is not uh, scientific the way that we would like it to be in 2020. And as a result, it's not FDA approved. Um, it is prescribable um, because some pharmacies will sell it and they'll even compound it in a capsule for you. But I think regulatorily, this fits into the uh, sphere of a food supplement. Technically, it's a food supplement that you're giving a child when you treat them with bromide. Um, I think that the role in treatment for bromide is for kids that really respond well to benzodiazepines like clobazam, but then have a rapid waning of their ther therapeutic efficacy because of tachyphylaxis, which is where with benzodiazepines, you know, the benzodiazepine receptor uh, is a GABA receptor and it releases chloride into the cell and it hyperpolarizes the cell. Well, when benzodiazepines hit that receptor over and over again, the cell recognizes that that's happening and it makes less receptors. And so the benzodiazepine comes in and there's nothing to hit and the benzodiazepine does nothing. And not nothing literally because there's some there, but instead of having a billion, you have half of a billion. And so the effect of the benzodiazepines is smaller. When that happens, the effectiveness to fight seizures wanes, but for some unfair reason, we still have the same number of side effects in my experience. And so now you have none of your cake and uh, you're just unhappy. Um, bromide, I think, steps into that role because there is no bromide receptor. It is also hyperpolarizing the cell membrane the way that the GABA receptor would using chloride, but there is no receptor involved. It just directly changes the resting membrane potential because it's an ion. And by doing that, it helps the kids that responded well to the benzodiazepines but it doesn't have that wearing off phenomenon that not only benzodiazepines do, but also phenobarbital, which is kind of thought of as a more effective, more powerful 
um, GABAergic medication. That's, I think, true, but bromide, I think, is more powerful than either of them because it has staying power. So um, the things about bromide that are important to know in terms of adverse effects, number one, um, it can cause acne. Um, this is something that's excreted in your sweat glands. Some bacteria really love it, and when some bacteria really love it and others really hate it, those bacteria that love it grow and grow and grow, and you get really ugly looking acne in some people. In my experience, this tends to be adolescents who are prone to acne anyway, but it can get really bad. In younger kids, they tend not to get it, I think, because they're not sweating in the same way. Um, another side effect of bromide is that it can make your chloride level shoot up through the roof. And this is such a dramatic effect that if you go to the emergency room and have your chloride level measured, why would you? Well, because it's part of the basic electrolyte panel that is always measured essentially when a person has a seizure. Um, the doctor comes in and looks white as a sheet and terrified because the chloride level is through the roof. And we never see this in medicine. They don't have no idea what's causing it or why it is or what it means, but they're afraid that the person is going to just, you know, die from it because it's just so extreme, which is a good thing to be afraid of. Luckily, in this case, it's an artifact of the way that the laboratory measures the bromide and it's not even real. Um, the, the, the bromide shows up as chloride, the machine counts it, uh, based on its molecular weight and it gets more weight than it should and therefore it looks high when in actual fact the chloride level is fine. Um, I think those, oh the last thing about bromide that's super important to know is that the half-life is so long you just can't make changes in the dose of the bromide sooner than every two weeks or every six weeks because the half-life is, is a week and a half or two weeks long. So if you wait three half-lives um, that's really necessary to make sure that you don't overdo it and um, end up with a higher dose of bromide than you expected. So I think that covers adverse effects. Uh, we talked about its role in treatment for kids that respond to benzos, but then have tachyphylaxis now that we're off. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip over the ketogenic diet and the VNS, both of which are totally valid treatments in Gervais syndrome, um, but I think are a little bit more familiar to people and you're able to get those kinds of um, you know, data points and feedback from your individual neurologists. Um, so with that, I just thank you for your attention and time. Um, I know that uh, taking an hour of your day in the middle of a, uh, um, pandemic to spend it on more Zoom isn't what <laughs> anybody looks forward to. So I really appreciate your interest and your willingness to, to come today. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. Um, I think that was great that we had questions sort of interspersed throughout. Um, if anyone else has another question before we wrap up, um, that would be fantastic. Go ahead and drop it in or ask it yourself. Um, and then remember that um, this is the last in our live sessions, but these are all going to be housed um, on the DSF website. Uh, you can register to see any of the seven um, different webinars in this series. Um, we've just really enjoyed all of our uh, medical advisory board coming to, to speak to the community about all these really important topics. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Miller. My pleasure. Thank you. All right.